Let's talk about and dispel some autism stereotypes. Oof, I'm sorry you guys. I'm having a difficult time talking today, especially with these headphones on because I have super degraded jaw joints. I chewed on a piece of broccoli the other day and it completely obliterated my joints and I haven't been able to chew really for the past week. And apparently now I have a hard time talking because the headphones are kind of impacting my joints a little bit. So I don't know why I said that. It's just bothering me and it's causing sensory issues. To kind of preface this, I'm going to be talking about these topics through the lens of someone who may be a high masking autistic just because I don't think people like us are represented enough in research and online and in society. I think it's extremely important for us to begin to open up that dialogue in that sense. And I think you guys will start to realize that a lot of the stereotypes that we have of autism directly harms people like me and and other high masking autistics in so many different complex ways in society and in our interpersonal relationships. I think these stereotypes are oftentimes used to invalidate our autism. You will often hear people say things like, you cannot be autistic because you can do this, or you are able to do that, or you are this. I'm trying to compose myself and find my words. I feel very, very passionate about this topic because I feel like to this day, we don't have research, we don't have society understanding the ways that people like me are impacted. There's this idea that you cannot be autistic because you are not as autistic as this person. Or even if you are autistic, you are expected to function as if you're not because you mask or your needs are not worth being accommodated to, or you do not need support because you are higher functioning. But the reality is, is that there's so many nuances to being a high masking autistic. And it's not as simple as we have lower support needs. It is not as easy as we are higher functioning, right? In that sense, I really despise and disagree with the concept of levels of autism, level one, two, three. I don't even really resonate with higher or lower support needs because I don't know how far research is gonna go in my lifetime when it comes to autism, but maybe years from now, someone can quote me at the age of 27 talking about this. I genuinely feel like a lot of autistic people who may be high masking go through extremely hard aspects of life in such invisible ways. There's this concept that if you are able to mask, you are capable of doing all these other aspects of life. You are able to hold it together. When in reality, there's so many things about being a high masking autistic that is so difficult. I feel like a lot of the times those of us who keep it together enough to come across like we are doing relatively okay on the surface are struggling so deeply within. And we oftentimes do it on our own and without support when we desperately need it. And it comes across in instances like when you are nonverbal, people still expect you to talk. People still expect you to process and interact and continue doing and being productive when in reality you are genuinely disabled in that moment and unable to speak and unable to process. There's moments where people like me have genuine meltdowns that are debilitating and people think you're just being dramatic and you're just having these outbursts or tantrums because you want attention when in reality in that moment you need help, you need support, you need understanding, you need accommodations, but no one's there to help help with that. There's moments where people like me are so consistently dysregulated through our day to day with no help and no support and then our health gets severely impacted. I don't know if there's even statistics for this yet, but I highly suspect that a lot of high functioning, high masking autistics, level one autistics also have comorbid mental health conditions and physical health conditions, whether that's autoimmune disease, whether that's chronic illness, whether that's chronic pain, you know, there has to be some sort of correlation there. And I don't think there's 
research yet directly linking autism to these types of health conditions, but I do know there are books out there who are finally talking about these types of concepts. The Myth of Normal by Dr. Gabor Mate, The Body Keeps Score, these are wonderful books that highlights how trauma and how a dysregulated nervous system, how your mental health could essentially affect your physical health. But enough of that. I'm going to move on to reading some of your comments and these stereotypes. I just want you guys to understand the backstory as to why I think it's so important to talk about this. And I want you to understand the weight of these stereotypes and how it impacts people like me. And I want you guys, whether you're autistic or not, to approach this with openness and with the willingness to learn and integrate this knowledge into your lives the best way that you can. All right, so the first stereotype is that autistic people are unable to make eye contact. This is a very common trait that I have heard and I thought was completely real and infallible. It is one of the many reasons why I, for most of my life, did not think I was autistic because I, for the most part, was able to make eye contact with people. I was able to even make eye contact during conversation. And I've talked here and there about this type of concept, but I just kind of want to add on to it. I feel like it's not as simple as you're unable to make eye contact with someone. I think what it is, is more so when you're autistic or when you're neurodivergent, there's a lot of different ways that we're processing information. If you just look at the individual neuron, the nerve cell, um, this is a very, I think, a very interesting study. So on the right, we've got a neuron from a brain uh, from someone who had autism, and on the left, a typical individual. And again, with the naked eye, you should be able to see more of the white dots all along the neuron. And each dot is a location of a dendritic spine or uh, the location of synapses where the neuron is making connections with its neighbor. So this is suggesting more connectivity between neurons in the autistic brain, not just more neurons, but more connections between neurons uh, in autism compared to a typical brain, giving you a flavor of the differences uh, between someone with autism and someone without autism. I feel like when it comes to eye contact, for me and for those who relate to me, it's less about whether or not we're able to make eye contact and it's more about what our eyes need to do in order to process the information the interaction and the conversation at hand so if i am talking to someone and we're talking about something that requires me to visualize something i have a difficult time with verbal communication i have a hard time following verbal communication and instructions and so if someone is talking about something that needs me to really really focus and visualize what's going on because that's the only way I could process what's being said to me. I cannot just look at your eyes or your face. My eyes need to go all over the place. And this kind of goes into the concept of EMDR and eye movements and how that correlates to your brain, right? And your neurology. And this is something as well that my neuropsychologist noted during my assessment but when someone is communicating to me, the more I can move my eyes all over the place, the more I could process the verbal words being said to me. And the better I can visualize something in my mind that correlates and helps me understand what's being communicated to me. The thing is, people like me get shunned and taught to not move our eyes like this because it's seen as inappropriate or it's seen as weird. And so we're constantly being taught throughout our lives, like make sure you're making eye contact, make sure you're not looking away from someone. These are rude behaviors, basically. We hold ourselves accountable to those types of norms, right? And we kind of get tricked out of what works naturally for us and what helps us process. And we end up being forced to process things in a way that doesn't help us process to the best of our capacity. And so what I've come to notice is in moments where I need to be looking around, but I'm kind of forcing myself to make eye contact, it becomes extremely overstimulating and overwhelming and doesn't allow me to process what is being communicated 
because I'm just focusing on keeping my eyes on the person in one place and I'm unable to visualize what they're saying. I'm unable to process what they're saying. I just kind of go blank. And there's been ways that I've been able to trick myself into looking like I'm making eye contact with someone and still be able to maintain conversation relatively. For example, if I force myself to make eye contact with someone while they're talking to me, I could dysregulate myself to a point where I am forcing myself to go from a baseline up into this extremely dysregulated state where I'm in this fight or flight, where I'm in this heightened sense of awareness. And I'm almost in this survival state physically, right? In our head, FFF alarms cause our brain to focus on negative memories, probably so it can scan them to avoid danger and negative outcomes. We get tunnel vision as our pupils dilate to increase our focus and long vision, but as a result, we lose our peripheral vision. FFF activation also reduces our ability to recognize differences in facial expressions. I have to get myself to that point, almost like I'm ready to go on a sprint in order to process everything that they're saying and be able to maintain eye contact and focus. Yes, maybe to them, it looks like I'm making eye contact and I'm able to have a conversation, but underneath the surface, my heart rate is at like 116. I'm sweating profusely and my nervous system is all whack because that's what it takes to be able to maintain just a normal interaction with eye contact. And this is something that my friends and I have talked about because they have recently learned about my autism this past year they asked me about that question because they were like Irene we never noticed anything off with your eye contact and I told them you know I would prefer to not make eye contact with you guys but at this point I am so well trained that I force myself to make eye contact with you and they were like oh would it make you more comfortable if you just didn't have to look at us while we we're talking and I told them, you know, yes, that would be amazing. And that would probably make me feel a lot more comfortable and literally more regulated because I don't have to get myself to that heightened state in order to process everything at once and respond appropriately. And that's gonna be a common theme that we're probably gonna come across often as we go through these stereotypes is that there's not necessarily deficits that we have, you know, the eye contact deficit, the social deficit, or we're incapable of doing these things. It's more so we're capable but it always comes at a cost and the cost is always of our mental health or of our physical health or both like it takes a lot to be able to function at that capacity but we can function at that capacity it's just really really hard and detrimental so the next stereotype that i commonly see is that autistic people are not empathetic and that we have low emotional intelligence this is something that i personally came across as well specifically with my old psychiatrist when i brought up that i thought i was autistic I remember she was extremely offended and she went down a list of reasons as to why I cannot be autistic. This was one of the reasons she stated. She said, it seems like you have emotional intelligence and usually people with autism do not have emotional intelligence. This is exactly why these stereotypes are so harmful because there's literal medical professionals that will tell people like me that you are not autistic because of these stereotypical traits. I don't think it's as simple as an autistic person is unable to be empathetic or doesn't have emotional intelligence. I just feel like people like us do not express it in a way that people can understand and have experienced before. And this is why I feel so strongly about neurodivergent, but especially autistic people beginning to unmask and show up in a way that feels natural to us. Because as we do that, not only are we alleviating that burden off of ourselves and off of our actual bodies and our nervous systems, but we are also, because of that, making our life more sustainable. But a substrate of that is it impacts the people around us. So it creates a space for those around us to begin to understand another way of existing. People are naturally adaptable to changes. We learn by experiencing. Whether or not that learning process is fast and open 
is another topic. But for the most part, if you are an autistic person who's finally unmasking, who's finally operating in a way that feels natural to you, people are going to begin to get used to it. They're going to begin to understand it more and learn more about it. That then creates space for other people to allow themselves to show up in similar ways that may be different and may have been shunned in the past. But now as more and more people are showing up in different ways, more and more people around the world have more freedom to show up in an authentic way to them, whether or not they're neurodivergent. So you're not only creating space for other neurodivergents to begin to unmask and show up authentically, but sometimes you may be creating space for other neurotypical people who may resonate with your way of showing up to begin to show up in similar ways. There's no right or wrong way to be and to exist. It's just a matter of having different ways to show up and exist and operate. One isn't better than the other, it's just different. And I think that's what makes the world beautiful is if people had the freedom to show up as they are and play into their own unique individual strengths. But anyways, back to emotional intelligence. I really don't know how I went so off topic. I feel like when it comes to empathy, what I find is that autistic people tend to express their empathy in ways that are usually looked down upon. And this is because of ableism, right? I'm going to try to list some ways that I've seen autistic people exhibit their empathy. So on one hand, I do think a lot of autistic people show their empathy through trying to help either problem solve or help directly with acts of service. I think sometimes when someone shows up in that way, it could be looked down upon because people may think, okay, this person's extremely cold. They don't really care about my emotions. They're not really showing emotions. They just wanna jump straight into doing something for me or helping to give me advice or doing research about the thing I'm struggling with when in reality, I just want them to listen, to affirm me and to maybe even hug me or something. But I've seen that for some autistic people, the way that we could show that we care is by doing research, giving you advice, being there to listen to you and to say, hey, maybe we could try this, maybe we could try that. And I think sometimes people may think that it's coming from a place where we're trying to flex our knowledge or we're trying to communicate that we know better than them, when in reality, where it comes from is just you are in distress. I don't know how else to help you other than providing some sort of pathway for you to navigate through to get to the other side of this distress so that you don't have to deal with it anymore. On the other hand, I think other autistic people exhibit their empathy by being way too over empathetic. So feeling all that emotion that the other person's feeling to the extent where we're completely dysregulated and we cannot do anything. And sometimes these autistic people could go into a state of depression, this state of overwhelm, overstimulation, shutdown, or even a meltdown. And likewise, I've heard so many autistic people exhibit empathy for inanimate objects or animals in ways that an holistic person cannot even fathom. And I think we see this so often, such a heightened sense of empathy that it almost sends you into this debilitated shutdown where you're so overwhelmed that you cannot process or express how that's impacting you. And I think it has a lot to do with, again, how you process information and how that affects your nervous system. I used to cry when my brothers would punch my stuffed animals or pretend to strangle them in front of me because I literally thought they were alive. And I remember hitting a point in teenagehood where I had to almost shut down that empathy because it was dysregulating me so intensely on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that's another aspect of the whole topic of empathy is there comes a point where it becomes so dysregulating that some people's way of coping is to kind of dull that sense of empathy. And I think sometimes that's where the stereotype can come from as well, where people think autistic people can't empathize, is maybe they're coming across an autistic person who are so overly empathetic that they force themselves out of survival to stop feeling and exhibiting their empathy just to get by. 
All right, so those are some of the most common stereotypes when it comes to autism. Of course, there's so much more, but I can't get to it all in today's video. If you guys like this video, please let me know in the comment section down below for me to make a part two, because there's so many more other attributes that I didn't even get to. And I'd be curious to know how any of these stereotypes have specifically impacted you in your own personal life. Other than that, I hope today's video has been insightful and validating. Again, thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure you guys take some time to regulate yourselves. With that being said, I'll see you on the next video. Bye.